It's the swan song. It's the final, the most extraordinary of all of the great megalithic monuments of Western Europe. We've had three grants from the HRC. The first one was to look at the Beaker people. Many of them were buried in the round barrows around here. After that, we were funded for the Stonehenge Riverside project, excavating at Darrington Walls as well as at Stonehenge. And we've just completed a third project, which is looking at the resourcing. You know, who came from where, what did they need to actually construct this thing? Stonehenge has its first stage 5,000 years ago. It was built in the decades shortly after 3000 BC and in that initial stage it appears to have been a much larger monument but with smaller stones. 500 years later, around 2500, that's when it took the form that it has today. So that's about four and a half thousand years ago. There are plenty of stone circles in Britain, but what makes Stonehenge so unusual is that they have shaped the stones. Uh, our laser scanning has shown the extent to which they were pecking the surfaces of these stones with hammers, with, with stone hammers, and um, also, of course, putting stones on top of each other as lintels. There are mortise and tenon joints. There's a sense that they're copying carpentry. We've basically got two types of stones used to build Stonehenge. The very big ones, which are sarsen. It's a type of sandstone and it's found in this area, but particularly some 20 miles to the north in the Marlborough Downs. Uh, but for me, perhaps the most interesting ones are the little ones. And they're two meters or so high. All of these are found in a very small part of West Wales and uh, our geologists have just been tracking down the locations and it's there that I think we may have an answer to just what Stonehenge was all about. Our hypothesis is that actually these were supplying not Stonehenge but a local stone circle in Wales. If that's the case, what I think we're seeing is the amalgamation of two of the most ancient and important ceremonial centres within Britain. Two separate tribes with different ancestral origins. This is a monument all about the ancestors and that's what those stones represent. That's why it was so important to bring some from Wales as well as others locally. What we've learnt from our excavations, both here and at Darrington Walls, is that Darrington Wall seems to have been a complementary complex to go with Stonehenge. Whereas Stonehenge was built in stone and was specifically for the dead, Darrington Walls was a place where people were living. And we've excavated the houses in what must have been a very large settlement of thousands of people. And we think that was probably the builder's camp where they were actually living when they were working here. Uh, but it wasn't simply a campsite, it had its own ritual and religious focus in that there are a series of timber circles uh, at that particular complex, the most well known being Woodhenge, uh, one of the sites that we investigated as well as part of the grant. We've also discovered quite possibly the reason why Stonehenge is here and that is that outside of its entrance uh, the avenue that runs down to the river and links it up in this sort of larger complex with Darrington Walls. The start of that avenue is um, a natural feature, uh, basically a series of periglacial ridges and fissures, and they seem to have built on directly on top of that. So it looks as though they may well have seen this as a special place in the natural world where the sky, the heavens and the earth were effectively combined into one. 
it's always been the astronomy, at least since the 60s, that's grabbed people's imagination about Stonehenge. What we've come to the realisation of is that the astronomy is just a part of it. And this is already a combination of astronomy and ancestors that we've seen at New Grange in Ireland, at Mace Howe in Orkney, where we have tombs built with that aspect yes. towards the midwinter sunrise or yes. sunset. And of course, that's exactly what's going on here. And also discovering that the main axis, the most important one, isn't for midsummer sunrise, it's midwinter yes. sunset. Archaeology is an expensive pursuit. It's not simply taking students into the field and digging. There's a huge amount of behind the scenes laboratory work. Although we had a mosaic of funding from many different organizations, the HRC money made it possible to do the work on the scale that we did. The research we have done isn't simply going into dusty old tomes and academic journals. This it has a really immediate impact on not just the public of Britain, but the public around the world. It's very clear that since our work, that has generated more visitors coming to Stonehenge because Stonehenge has been in the newspapers and our discoveries have been front page in papers all around the world. There's this new visitor centre at Stonehenge and that is the opportunity to actually put our results into a format that visitors to Stonehenge will be able to appreciate. So even if they never read a book, if they never look at an article about Stonehenge, this is their chance to find out what the HRC has supported as research.